I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20 is our text, uh, and we uh, invite all of you to, to join with us. And saying, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that is perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Uh, if you're here at the Sweetwater campus or at uh, McCulloch campus, or if you're at the Parker campus, then just go back to the table in the back, grab one of the Bibles there. And, and as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, please take one. It, it is our gift to you. We're serious about you having the Word of God and reading the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Uh, so uh, where is your most restful, relaxing, peaceful place that you've ever been? Okay, don't tell me. Uh, I do want you to tell each other, though. So I want you to take just a moment and tell the person sitting next to you, where's your favorite, relaxing, peaceful place? place that, that just you can just let go of all your worries, all your stress, and, and just be at peace. Ready, set, go. Where's your place? <laughs> okay, now some of you sound like you're planning trips. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Just don't, don't do it on my time. That's what, you know, after the service, you guys can go get something to eat. You can hang out. You can uh, go ahead and plan all the trips you want. See, the, the place for me was uh, and is Hawaii. Uh, first time I went there was uh, like the first vacation, the real vacation that my wife and I took. And, and uh, we'd been married 16 years, and, and we got there, and it was just like everything just kind of melted away. And I was like, oh, wow. This is, this is what paradise looks like, because, you know, any direction you look, it was beautiful, and, and, and there just was, it was just so chill. It's the only place I know more relaxed than Lake Havasu. And uh, so, the, you know, I was just hooked then. So today we are discussing the fourth commandment. If you've just joined us, we're in a series called Guardrails, where we're looking at the Ten Commandments. And, and today we're looking at the fourth commandment, which a lot of times is misunderstood, or at least interpreted in a lot of different ways. And, and we believe that the commandments of God are given to us to keep our lives from crashing. That's why it's called guardrails. And uh, God wants to bless us if we'll stay inside the guardrails. And so we're looking at his commands, trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, but before we look at the text today, what I want to do is see how you're doing with the challenge. Because when we started this series, I challenged you and said, hey, learn the Ten Commandments. Learn what they are. We started off with like, you know, 14% of, the, of Americans know the Ten Commandments. We want to increase that. And, and so uh, have you got them down yet? Because in a couple weeks, I'm going to test you on it. I'm going to have them tell you, you know, have you tell them to the people, you know, uh, sitting around you. They, they start off with, you know, God saying, I'm the Lord your God who, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he lists the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any idols or graven images. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Ten statements. You guys are all smart enough to learn these. Okay? So, you know, work on them. Test each other. Uh, you know, when you're getting something to eat, say, how many do you know? Uh, check out each other, you know, uh, whether you know them in life group. And, and uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and encourage one another to do this. But tonight... Today we're looking at Exodus 20, uh, verses 8 through 11, the fourth commandment. And here is what God says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates— for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now this is one of the guardrails that God gives us to bless us and keep our lives from crashing. But for this to make sense to us, we need to first grasp the original intent. The original intent. What is it that... that God was saying to the Israelites, what was he trying to, to teach them? What was he trying to get them to understand? Uh, because God gave this command to the nation of Israel. They weren't yet, you know, a people in the land, but they were on their way. And he gave them this command. And, and so let's talk about why it was important. So first of all, we have to begin with a little bit of history. Uh, 
So let's talk about some history. God instituted the Sabbath with Israel for several reasons, okay? We, we just, he's having this conversation with his people. They don't really know him, okay? He's revealing himself to them. He's establishing them as a people for his own possession. They're going to be the people. They're going to bless the whole world because Messiah is coming through them. And he's getting them ready for Messiah. He's getting them ready to understand who he is. And, and the first reason that he instituted the Sabbath was for them to remember God's deliverance on a consistent weekly basis. Okay? He wanted them to remember. So every week, I want you to stop as a nation for the purpose of worshiping God. You know, the God who created you, the God who created this world, the God who created everything, and the God who delivered you from slavery. I want you to stop. I want you to pause. And I want you to remember what I have done for you. And then they observe the Sabbath as a real demonstration of trusting in God to provide. Think about this. These were people who were farmers and, and shepherds. Okay, so they were subsistence farmers. They were subsistence, you know, raising livestock, trying to stay alive. And, and, and God says, I want you to stop working one day each week to remember me. And in stopping the work, you're demonstrating that you trust me to provide for you. You're saying, hey, God wants us to stop for a day and not do any labor, and we trust him enough to do this. Uh, and, that, you know, for them to do that required faith that God was going to provide, just like he did in the wilderness. Now, if you don't know the story, I'd encourage you to go home and read Exodus 16, because that's where the, the story of God miraculously providing for the people uh, is told that the story is like this. The people are hungry. They're traveling in the wilderness. They're farmers, but they can't farm. You know, they've got animals, but if they, you know, kill them and eat them, then they're not going to have any animals eventually. And they go, hey, we're getting hungry. And they start complaining and griping. And God miraculously provided food for them in the wilderness. It's a food that the Bible calls manna. Uh, literally, the word manna means, what is it? You know, no, 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 seriously, it means, what is it? That's what it means in Hebrew. So you guys are going, it's bread. No, it's bread-like is what they said. It's like, what is it? I, let's just call it, what is it? So, uh, so that's what they called it. They, and, and so they, God miraculously, and, and he ended up doing that for 40 years while they were in the wilderness. He provided for them, and each day they were to go out and collect one day's supply of manna. And, and if they collected two days' supply, then they had leftovers, the leftovers rotted. Like overnight, boom. Except... The day before the Sabbath, he told them to collect two days' worth, and it didn't rot. Because God wanted to provide for them. He wanted them to trust him that he was going to provide. And, and so he, uh, he, he gave them this miracle food and wanted them to trust him. And so once they got into the land, he wanted them to trust him and take a day off of work. And then finally, the Sabbath, uh, it was instituted by God because it united the nation in a weekly declaration of faith in God that says, hey, as a people, we obey God, and we're going to observe the Sabbath as a people to regularly repeat our confession that there is only one God, and we're going to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our strength. Okay, that, that's, that's what they were supposed to be doing with Sabbath. Now, if you follow the history of the Israelites and you read the rest of the Old Testament, you find that they didn't do this very well. In fact, usually they didn't do it at all. They worshipped other gods, they ignored the Sabbath, and in doing that, they invited God's judgment. And we're talking about for over 500 years, they pretty much lived in disobedience until in 587 B.C., uh, Babylon destroyed Jerusalem and took most of the leadership of Jerusalem into captivity into Babylon. And for 70 years, they lived in captivity. And when God finally released them and they went back to Jerusalem, you know what they did? They observed the Sabbath. <laughs> they kept the laws. They, they actually started living what God had commanded. It only took them 500 years to get there, but they got there. 500 years and the destruction of everything they loved. But, you know, but they got there. And, and, uh, and so then they, they started keeping the Sabbath uh, really zealously. In fact, keeping the Sabbath became such a big deal, it started overshadowing everything else that they did. It was one of those big tests of your spirituality, of your goodness as a person to observe the Sabbath. And by the way, among uh, Hasidic Jews, 
It still is to this day. If you visit Israel, which we're going to take another Israel trip in a couple of years, so if you're interested in going, you know, keep that in mind. But, uh, but in Israel, you go there, and on the Sabbath, they've got all these markers and all these things that are just unique uh, for the Sabbath. Like, for instance, they've got these things, these markers hanging up on, on power lines. And we're like, what are, the, what are those things? And they go, oh, that's how far they can go. In that community, that's how far the, the Hasidic Jews can travel on the Sabbath. They have boundaries. You go into a hotel, and you never, ever want to get on a Sabbath elevator. Do you know why? Because someone decided that pushing a button is work. That's work. Doesn't feel like work to me, but it, it, that's work. So they can't push a button. So how do they get up the, down the elevators? Because they go to the hotels on the Sabbath because that way other people are cooking and cleaning for them. I guess that whole thing about the sojourner not working doesn't apply anymore. So, uh, but they get on these Sab the Sabbath elevators, and the elevator goes and stops on every floor. Opens up, waits, closes, goes up, all the way up, all the way down. Slowly. <laughs> Sabbath elevator. You do not, hey, like, unless you're observing the Sabbath that way, you don't want to get on one of those Sabbath elevators. So, uh, it was a big deal. Keeping the Sabbath became like this test of spirituality. And then Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up. He's God in the flesh. He's Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled the law. He completed the old covenant. He established the new covenant. Which, by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we live by the new covenant. How do you know you're a follower of Jesus Christ? If you believe that, that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. You believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus personally, then guess what? You're living under the new covenant. And this new covenant is wrapped up in Jesus. And, and if you read the Gospels, which I encourage you to do, hopefully you're on that Bible reading plan, you're solidly in the book of Matthew, if you read the Gospels, you'll, you'll find that the single largest conflict point between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day was about the Sabbath. It was about the Sabbath. Because Jesus uh, repeatedly broke their man-made rules about keeping the Sabbath. And all the religious leaders are like, oh, oh you, you can't be a prophet. You can't be of God. You're breaking our Sabbath rules. I mean, Jesus even had the audacity to heal people on the Sabbath. I mean, imagine that. And when they were mad at him because he healed people on the Sabbath, he just made it clear that God always cares more about people than about man-made rules. He always cares more about people than he cares about external spirituality. About looking like you've got it all together. He cares about people. Jesus even had the audacity to say this. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath was a gift from God to bless us, not a prison for us to live in one day a week. So how do we understand this, this, this Sabbath rules. I mean, Jesus said, look, I want you to do good on the Sabbath, even if that means breaking the man-made rules, even if that means you have to heal, because healing is work, even if you have to push that button on the elevator. You see, the Sabbath was a day of rest from work. And Jesus embodies the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus became the Sabbath. Uh, if you really want to understand this, you have to read the, the book of Hebrews, because he talks about it at length in the book of Hebrews. But, you see, Sabbath was a day of rest. We're supposed to stop our labors and trust God. And guess what? If we trust in Jesus, he does the work for us. The work of atonement, the work of salvation, the work of eternal life, the work that you and I can't do. You see, the law, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant... Well, it was given, so the, here's, here's how you're supposed to live so that you can be good enough. And guess what? Nobody can keep the law. Nobody's good enough. So we're all hopeless. And Jesus stepped into the equation. And Jesus took your sins and my sins and the sins of the world upon himself. And he suffered and died on the cross. And he did the work of atonement. And guess what that means for you and me? That means that if we rest in Jesus, if we stop trying to earn our salvation and we receive the grace of God... Jesus does the work for us, and we 
our souls can find rest. That's the only way our souls can find rest, is by trusting in the person of Jesus to do what you and I can't do, which is pay for our sins. Now, if you're sitting here, and whether you've been in church your whole life, or whether it's the first time in forever that you've been here, uh, and you're trying really hard to be a good Christian, and you're hoping that you're going to be good enough to get to heaven, and you're kind of worried about when life comes to an end, what that judgment's going to look like, can I just tell you that, that you're still trying to work, and you need to rest in Jesus? You, you need to stop trying so hard and receive the mercy of God, the grace of God, and, and allow that good, His goodness to wash over you, because you're not going to be good enough. I have people tell me, I don't, just don't know if I'm good enough to go to heaven. I just, let, me, let me go ahead and remove your fears. You're not. <laughs> you are good enough to go to hell. That's what you're good enough to do. I'm good enough to go to hell, too. So, um, in fact, Scripture says that the wages of sin is death. So, I mean, I've earned it. You've earned it. We're there. It's Jesus. It's His mercy. It's His grace. And He's the Sabbath. So, if you're working really hard, stop working so hard. And just realize that Jesus paid for your sins, and if you've trusted him as Savior and Lord, if you've committed your life to following him, then guess what? You're okay. He's paid for your sins, all of them in the past, all of them in the future. Rest in that. Find peace in that. And by the way, that's the most important message of the Sabbath. And, and if you don't have that rest, then please find one of us after the service. We would love to talk to you about how you can know Jesus and how you can have that peace that passes understanding. Okay, we're going to be at the Connection Centers. The prayer team's going to be at the front. We don't want you to leave without knowing certain that Jesus is your Savior and you can rest in Him. Now, how does the Sabbath keep our lives from crashing today? What's the purpose today? Let's talk about this. Because we, we understand the Old Testament model. We understand why God gave the Sabbath. But we're under this new covenant. So... Uh, so what does that mean for us? How do we, you know, understand that the Sabbath was made for us, not us for the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is a gift for us, and it'll keep our lives from crashing if we'll observe the Sabbath or remember the Sabbath. So let's begin with understanding the purpose for us, or how does this commandment really keep our lives from crashing? So first purpose for us, for you and me today, as followers of Jesus, is to remember. Purpose is to remember. See, much like the nation of Israel, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you belong to the people of God. And so as the people of God, we want to create space and time in our lives each week to remember who God is and what God has done. We, we want to create some space in our week, some time in our week, to say, God, I understand that you're the King of kings, Lord of lords, and I want to worship you. Now, does that have to be on the seventh day? Saturday? No, it doesn't. Although the Saturday service would feel pretty good about themselves if it was, right? It's like, we're keeping the Sabbath. All the rest of you guys are losers. <laughs> Not so much. Does it have to be on Sunday? You know, when, when we started the Saturday night service, there were a lot of people who said, that just feels really weird to not go to church on Sunday. And I go, why? You went on Saturday. Well, I just saw my whole life, I grew up going to church on Sunday. It feels like I should be on church on Sunday. I go, great, come to church Saturday at Sweetwater and go serve at the other campuses on Sunday. I'm good with that. If you, feel, if you need to do it, then I'm okay with that. But see, that's just it. You don't have to do it on Sunday, even though, the, you know, the traditionalists think Sunday's the day because that's when the early church started meeting together. You know why the early church met together on the first day of the week? Because they couldn't do anything on the seventh day of the week because it was the Sabbath and they were all Jews. That, that's why. They couldn't even walk to get together. They had to wait until the Sabbath ended, then they could travel, get together, and worship together. So, does it matter which day of the week you gather? No, it doesn't. The Apostle Paul, who was himself an excellent Jew, a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, said this in Colossians chapter 2. He said, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. Hey, those of you who Keep telling me I should stop drinking the Diet Pepsi? Stop judging me. Scripture says so. <laughs> so therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. 
Don't let anyone judge you in regards to when you worship God, uh, you know, and, and how you honor God with your body and how you gather for worship. He says, look, it, 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 there's not a right way to do this. And this is a guy who grew up observing the Sabbath religiously, perfectly according to man-made rules. And he says, no. In, in fact, if you want to read more about the freedom in Christ, read Colossians chapter 2. It's a great chapter for that. But there is no set time that we have to remember that we have to gather together to celebrate. We just need to make sure that we make time to gather together and remember that God created. We need to remember that God created, that God is powerful, that he is creative. We've seen his beauty in creation. You know, in fact, the, the seventh day was set apart as holy because it took God six days to create, and then the seventh, was, he rested. And so we need to remember who God is. He's the creator. It's his world. You see, here at Calvary, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. In other words, we believe that it's God's world, and God gave us his word so that we know how to live in his world so that we can be blessed. So we're doing it his way. And we need to remember that it's his world, and his way is better than our way. And, and, and we need to yield to him and, and that he created every single person. And that every single person is made in the image of God. And, and that knowledge, that remembrance will change how we interact with people. That's how we can love our neighbors as ourselves. Right? Because if you look at your neighbor and they're just annoying and they bother you and they're irritating, you're not going to really love them until you look at them and see them as being made in the image of God and loved by God and Jesus paid for their sins on the cross and he wants them to come to that life-changing relationship with him that you and I have experienced. And then we can treat them differently. It doesn't matter if they're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if they're conservative or liberal. It doesn't matter if they're already alive or in utero. They deserve the respect because they're made in the image of God. So we need to remember that God created. We need to remember that God provides. Remember that God is responsible for providing for his people. So we need to stop from our labors and acknowledge that we trust God. It, you know, it kind of affirms that faith that in God that it's not about you and me. It's not about my skills, my abilities, my hard work, my blood, sweat, and tears. It's not about that. It, it's a gift from God. And we honor him by taking a Sabbath. We're saying, God, I'm going to stop working, and I'm going to trust in you to provide. So we remember that God created, we remember that God provides, and we remember that God rescues. God rescues. Why are we gathered here anyway? I mean, why are we in this room tonight? Because God rescued us. Because we were lost and Jesus found us and he's changed our lives and he's redeemed us from hell and he's given us hope beyond this world. And, and so we're here for him because God rescued us. He changed our lives and our destinies through his death and resurrection. And, and, and this was a theme that was big with Jesus. So let's just listen to Jesus, Gospel of John, third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus said God rescues. John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman at a well, and he said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. God rescues. John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. God rescues. John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and, and will go in and come out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. God rescues. How about John 11? The words of Jesus uh, to a, a woman who had just lost her brother. Her brother had died and she was in grief. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. God rescues. Or how about John 14? Jesus said to his disciples, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only one who can rescue 
This is why we worship. This is why we pray. This is why we sing. This is why we teach. This is why our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we want people to come to Jesus, believe, and have eternal life. Because there's hope in no one else. So we observe the Sabbath to remember. To remember all that God has done, that God has created, that God provides, that God rescues us. And by the way, if you're here and you're in a place where you need, feel like you need God to rescue you, again, we're just going to invite you to come to him and, and cast your life on him, your cares on him, and, and God will rescue you. Maybe not from the things that you want, but he'll rescue you from what matters most. Sin and death and hell. So the Sabbath helps us to remember, and the Sabbath helps us to rest. To rest. Hey, who needs a break? Who needs a vacation? Anybody who need one? How come half the people who raise their hands are retired? <laughs> you guys want to explain that to me? I, I, I talk to people who are retired all the time, and they say, I don't know how I had time to work. I am so busy, and I am so tired, and I, I need a break from retirement. I don't know what that's called. Oh, yeah, I do. Death. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> hey, 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 come on. You can go back to work, you know, I, I suppose. You see, as a nation, we are overworked and sleep-deprived. And think about it. We use drugs to help us get to sleep, and then we got to have a boost in the morning to get up and going, right? So, $45 billion is what Americans spent on sleep aids last year. Anyone else with me? Yeah? Oh, nobody wants to raise their hands. Oh, we sleep fine, preacher. We don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> sure. We spent $11 billion last year as Americans on energy drinks. Not counting coffee, just energy drinks. Anybody using those for a little boost in the day? Okay. Hey, you guys want to guess on how much we spent on coffee? For over $40 billion on coffee as Americans. Anybody? Okay. See, now I see those hands go up. Yeah. See? I don't use those nasty energy drinks or that Diet Pepsi trash. I just drink coffee. You see, we need rest. We need rest. I mean, I know this personally. I know what burnout looks like. I know how to justify more work because there's always more that needs to be done. And, and we feel so important that we've got to do it. And we've got to work harder and longer and not, not quit. And, and because everything's resting on us. Where's the faith in God in that? First 10 years I was pastor of Calvary, I, I didn't take a full day off if I was in town. It wasn't healthy. I got to the point uh, 10 years where I, I asked for a sabbatical and, and took it and took uh, four solid weeks off without doing any ministry work at all. And it, and it probably saved my ministry because I was burned out. And I realized that, that was an unhealthy pace. And I realized that I was being disobedient to God because I wasn't finding a place for rest. I wasn't setting a pace that was sustainable. And, and so I was disobedient to God's command to take Sabbath, to rest. I'd also been disobedient to my wife because she was smarter than me at that point. Uh, I was waiting for her to say amen because she's here tonight. But anyway... <laughs> So we do this to ourselves, and God says, rest. Observe the Sabbath. Trust me. Take a break. Be still and know that I am God. And yet many of us ignore it. We need to hear this, but we ignore it. And, and if we'll listen to God, it will definitely keep our lives and our families and our health from crashing. So why does God prescribe rest? Really two reasons. So we can renew. So we can renew. So we can refresh, restore our lives. Our bodies need rest. We not only feel better, but we also function better when we rest. Our minds need rest. So let go of the stress and just play. Hey, did anybody else grow up in churches where play was frowned upon, where it was seen as juvenile and immature besides me? So <laughs> the rest of you grew up in fun churches? Wow, I didn't know those existed. See, the, the thing is that, you know, it, it was always dismissed, and yet recreation, think about this. Think about the word recreation. It's recreation. 
It's recreation. It's to create again what God made. And so we need that recreation. We need that play, that fun. It is healing. It is restorative. It is renewing. Hey, we're trying to help you guys. April the 5th, we're going to have a, a, a Christian comedian here. His name's Tim Hawkins. He's one of the funniest guys you'll ever uh, see. And, and, uh, and, and we're going to have one show. It's going to be in here. And when the tickets sell out, they're sold out. So if you're interested in really... Uh, renewing and laughing and just having a good time that night uh, go online calvarylhc.com you can go to events you can check it out information's in your bulletin too but it just it just it's fun so what are you doing to plan rest in your life how are you renewing what is the sabbath for your mind for your body and when I say that, I'm not talking about a three-day vacation at Disneyland that each day is 18 hours and you come home and you are so tired you can't even move. That is not Sabbath. That's what we do with children, right? You need a vacation from your vacation, that kind? What are you doing for Sabbath, for rest in your life? God wants us to renew and God wants us to relate. Sabbath is for relationships. Obviously, God wants us to relate to Him on the Sabbath. Stop what you're doing and pay attention to me. Remember me. Worship me. Celebrate what I've done for you. Celebrate that you once were lost and now you're fine. Celebrate that you were slaves and now you're free. He wants that relationship with us. Make time for that. But Sabbath was also designed to give us time and space for relationships and community with each other. Think about it. With Israel, an entire nation stopped working. And everyone was at home or together in worship for the whole day. No TV, no smartphones, no internet, no washing machines. Just each other. They could talk, they could play, they could laugh, they could be together. So here's a question that I hope haunts you all week long. Do you have space in your life for relationships? For relationship with God? For relationship with other people? People that are important? Hey, families, and when I say families, I mean if, if you're here and you've got kids at home, do you have an evening that you spend together that's unplugged? I mean, where you turn off the video games and the phones and the tablets and the TV and, and you play board games or card games uh, and, and, or sit and stare at each other. I don't know. Uh, where you play together and talk together and, and look each other in the eye and build the relationships. That's Sabbath. That's what God gave us this time for. You see, this is what Sabbath does for us. It gives us time and margin to be with God and with the people that we love. It allows us to rest mentally and physically, to renew and to restore. And that's why we still want to remember the Sabbath. So that we can be a people that is holy and healthy before God. And Sabbath is a wonderful gift from God that helps us, helps keep us and our families healthy. So what are you going to do so that you can better observe Sabbath? God wants to bless you, he wants to bless me, if we'll listen to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for caring for us more than we care for ourselves. Thank you for trying to bless us by, by giving us guardrails on our lives about time and pace and energy and rest. You wouldn't think we'd need the reminders to be sane, but we do. So God, help us to change. Help us to pause. Help us to be still. Whether we have our own business or work for somebody else or retired, let us set aside time in our lives for you and for the people that matter. Let us stop being absorbed in social media or television or video games. And let's pay attention to the people around us and help us to pay attention to you. So God, change us so that we can live healthily as sons and daughters of God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.